dude, you got a professional ass setup. Holy shit. Oh yeah. I, I have a podcast too. So I, uh, I, I do this from here. Oh, no, uh, really? right now, right now I'm at the gym. So at the gym, I don't, don't want to move my camera too much, but yeah, this is the, I was in the gym. We have a little, uh, little room here and I have a guitar teacher who teaches out of this room. So we just changed it into a, a guitar teaching studio and also a podcast studio. All right. <laughs> Dang, that's peaceful. What's your podcast called? Yeah. The willpower quicks podcast. Nice. Is it just like a boxing podcast or what's it about? Yeah, pretty much anything and everything. Um, I, I don't know if you're too familiar with Johnny from Expert Boxing. Uh, he's on he's on YouTube. He's got a big YouTube channel, like 250,000 subscribers. Um, he uh, he and I do a lot of uh, uh, boxing review videos. So like, if you have sparring clips or um, talk about upcoming fights, and then sometimes on my podcast, I'm I'm by myself and I just talk motivation stuff, like trying to get people motivated and uh, you know how to how to lose weight or something, or like the best diet tips, boxing tips. Talk about all things jab. Well, talk about all things footwork stuff like that, and give people like ideas for their training stuff. So, yeah, I, I've not been active too much on it, but uh, I'm sure this will be part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Going good and everything like that. Yeah, everything's good. Good man. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of of what I've gone so far. Uh, right now, too, a class is finishing up. We have a a Parkinson's boxing class only, and so uh, we have a uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday at twelve o'clock, we have a uh, Parkinson's boxing class for those who are affected by the disease, and they're able to stay active and be able to move around and you know. Uh, make sure they they're good, you know. Yeah, oh, so. that's awesome. Where's uh? So your your gym is in Chicago. What's uh, if I'm not mistaken, correct? It's actually West Chicago. Okay. So um, it's a suburb, like maybe an hour outside the city. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a not not pe- not too many people know about that. Uh, they think West Side of Chicago or something. Um, but there's the West Chicago. There's also an East Chicago. Um. I never been there. I think that's like, like Indiana, but it's called East Chicago. Hmm. Um, but yeah, but yeah we, the, we're a small suburb called West Chicago. Are you a, are you, are you a Bears fan? A Bears fan? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For all my life, I've always been one. I'm not necessarily happy with them, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like, you know, you're, you're born and raised somewhere. You, you root for someone and then you get disappointed. There was one Super Bowl. They were part of, but the Packers, when Brett Favre was still running around, uh, you know, it was a very hard time for us out here. (laughs) I'm not too, I'm not too hardcore football. You know, I do watch it from time to time. I usually, when it does, when it's on season, I tend to watch the playoffs more than I do just the bears or something. Yeah. Dude, everyone, everyone, everyone always says that like football is such a physical sport. But and since yeah. you're a professional fighter, does it not seem that physical to you when you watch it? Oh, well, I play football, so I know I know the physicality of it. Um, you know, being a lineman, I mean, I guess you don't feel too much. I mean, you're pushing people and trying to move them out of the way to make those gaps for the runner back. Um, when I was lineman, it was it was it was pretty good times, you know, huh? You were a lineman? Yeah, I'm talking about fifth grade football, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I was gonna so, say, yeah, like, I'm, you gotta I'm be like, not that big, you know. Say, like, what are you like, um, a buck fifty, something like that, <laughs> offensive no, line? No, actually, I've gained some weight. Um, and I, I'm losing back some weight. I, w- my heaviest I've ever been was 185, and and I'm moving down. I'm 175 right now, so I've lost 10 pounds. Okay. But it's, you know, trying to get that extra inches down, I want to get back to 54. You know, 60. You know, um, I used to fight at 47, uh, walk around 52, drop a couple of pounds. But I don't know if I will see 47 again, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Dude, um, what I really wanted to have you on the podcast about the big elephant in the room is just that whole situation that happened with you with uh, the tobacco seed and all that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, uh, you know, I know it's I didn't really know how to transition into it. So I just thought I'd be blunt about it. But it has uh, a perfect transition. <laughs> yeah, like, like what? what the fuck happened? Like I, I saw the news articles. I saw the, the stuff that was posted on like news. Oh, wow. Okay. 
that shit was crazy, dude. That was insane. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, it was a hard time for me back then because I wasn't even thinking about professional fighting. You know, I was it, I was in the state of mind where, like, I want to get a house. I want to move out. I want to go to college. I want to do all that stuff. And during that time in my life, um, you know, I was I was, you know, fucking around. I, you know, I was smoking weed, you know, doing all that shit. And um, there's nothing wrong with it, you know. But back then it was, you know, kind of you know, frowned upon, I guess you can say it was still illegal. And, um, and, you know, I want to do things differently. I didn't want to, you know, sell dope or anything, but you know, there was the time where spice or the fake weed was big and, um, Kratom was, was hitting the, the U S market and Kratom is, or Kratom, whatever, some people pronounce it differently. It's not regulated by the FDA. And, you know, in fact, you know, you can still buy it today at um, any smoke shop. It's legal now. It's totally fine in Illinois. But back then it wasn't regulated. So I bought Kratom. I was selling it. I was selling a lot. I used to have a website called KratomChicago.com. You know, I used to sell on eBay. <laughs> you just sell whatever I could. And I was saving up cash just to put a down payment on a house. And uh, one one day out of the blue, this guy messaged me. He's like, hey, you know, I like the Kratom, but I'm looking for something else. Do you have poppy pods? And I'm like, the fuck is that? So I Googled it. I don't, can I swear on this podcast? I'm not too sure. Oh, no, fuck yeah, I'm good. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so I look up Google poppy pods, right? And boom, 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 list after list. I see like different stores selling it, pictures, you know, pictures of these dried plants that are like like a like a light bulb, bulb, bulb with a stem hanging out. And um, like I put in my order, I think it was like 80 bucks for a pound. And I, and I resold it for like $200, you know, and the guy wanted two pounds. So I got, you know, $400. Right. And so, um, I made delivery, you know, and he, he said he wanted more and I got him more And that day. Boom, boom, boom. Right. I went into his car, talked for a little bit and, uh, I heard this knock on the window. Bam, bam, they dragged me out. It was a SWAT team, dude. I got swatted. It was a scary time, dude. They got machine guns and all this stuff pointed at me. I spent a whole week in jail, got bailed out. And, um, you know, we got a, a, a felony on my case and we, got a lawyer right obviously who was able to drink bring it down to a, a class one which i got a class x which is the highest felony you can get in illinois and it's facing a minimum of 12 and a maximum of 50 if i'm found guilty of it what's let me let me just cut you off real quick um what's uh were you were they charging you with uh, a super class x felony for manufacturing and distributing a controlled substance okay and but, you know, if you test out poppy seeds, you know, it's going to come out as morphine and heroin and all that stuff, codeine. Um, so obviously when they test out the seeds and the pods, it's going to come out that way. And it and, and it doesn't matter how little you, you can have like a speck of Coke and a, and a whole gram or a whole ounce of baking soda. If it just tests once for for Coke, you will get test. You'll get, you know, a mess um, arrested for the whole thing. You know, it does not matter how little or how uh, diluted the, the substance is. As long as it tests for it, you're going to get busted for the whole entire weight of the thing, you know. And so, um, unfortunately, that's what they did to me. Um, and we were able to get a second look at the, the pods, whatever. And the guy who tested is this bot botanist said in order to get the same effect of heroin or morphine or any of these drugs, you will have to get kilos and, and, and a lot of, of, you know, like 50 pounds of this just to extract the, the residue that's in these pots to get the same effect as you would in one gram of heroin. And that's what we're arguing in court. And, um, you know, but that was after we got the second lawyer, the first lawyer, we we're able to get it down, reduced to a class one. It was up to 200 grams of whatever and uh we accepted that plea deal what is what is what does the sentence look like for a class one like you said the class x is 12 to 50 what's class one uh a year to two years okay yeah so, if i'm not mistaken the original stuff you were selling the kratom was it yeah was that illegal to sell 
No, no, it's it, you can buy right now today in Illinois. You can go to a smoke shop. They they have it there. So why did they like approach you for the and was the poppy? I mean, you said said you saw other stores selling poppy seeds. So like, yep. why did they approach you with one? Because you weren't selling anything illegal. So why would they approach you? And then two, like, if it's not illegal to sell, why are they arresting you for selling poppy seeds? So I so I think what happened was the informant. It was an informant. You know, I kind of missed this part. Guy said he wanted to trade them. Hey, my friend wants them, right? So my assumption is that the kid who was the first person that asked me about it, uh, I think he got caught up with some shit, right? And he wanted to find someone to bust so that way his case gets reduced to nothing or whatever, you know? Right. Um, so I think he was an informant who got me someone uh, and told his police officer, hey, I got somebody, you know, and so it ended up being that way. I'm not too sure. They, they, you know, once they arrested me, they separate you two. For, they separate those both. So the guy who was pretending to be the buyer was separated from me. So I know he was obviously a, 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 a cop. So. So as far as what happened and his backstory, I'm not too sure. But my only guess is that's what happened is that an informant ratted on me because he found someone that he can get his own sentence reduced to something else. You know, that's my guess, because a lot of people think, oh, it's a isn't that a entrapment? That sounds like an entrapment to me, you know. Um, but but like it, what what the what my second lawyer said, because our first lawyer kind of sucked. But he did a good job in the sense that he got it reduced from a super X to a class one, which is the first felony level in the tier system of felonies. Um, but but we wanted to beat the whole thing and said, this is not even what you're saying it is, because in order to get that, you would need X amount of poppy pots to extract to make of, you know, a full on dosage of, of heroin. Right. Um, and. And so our second lawyer fought it. We took it to the appellate court, but it stopped there. The, the, the first judge looked at me in the eye and said, you guys have a good case. I think you should really take this up to the appellate court. And on light live, you know how they write down things and they type on the typewriter or whatever. Um, uh, <clears throat> so it was definitely on record that she said, like, you, you should take it up. That made it. You're, way- you're saying that made it into the transcript? Of what of he said. Okay, okay. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Sully Special. I just wanted to take a few moments to tell you about our sponsor, Raw Wellness. Their goal is to inspire you to take your health into your own hands and fearlessly follow your dreams with the help of their hemp and herbal products. To learn more about Raw Wellness, go check them out at www.feelrocco.com. Again, that's www.feelrocco.com. Raw Wellness, sending good vibes one dose at a time. Because we got because it goes from the county courts to the the next level up, which is the appellate court, uh, the state, and then it, it, the highest can go all the way up to the Supreme Court. You know, federally. Um, and so that's what would have happened if we went to the appellate court, the appellate court says, yeah, okay, let's move it up. But the thing is we elect judges, we elect judges to be a person to, you know, charge people. Right. And so this judge was facing reelection. So to on my bad luck, you know, the judge didn't want to put that on her case on her side that they, you know, they got this kid off of this when he was a drug dealer, or whatever, because that could affect her reelection. So, so that, uh, so the appellate court just stopped it and said, no, we're, we're, we, 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 you already took the plea bargain. So you're going to have to accept it, you know? And so ever since then I've been caught or, um, um, I've been, you know, I got a felony on my record now for forever, you know, seven years, it gets expunged, but, you know, um, I don't have to worry about expunging it because I got a gym now. You know, everything happens for a reason. And after I got all that felony on my case, on my record, you know, all I had was boxing. You know, my dad was like, you know, if you know, with this felony case, I want you to be it's going to be hard for you to get a job. It's going to be hard for you to get to scholarships. So uh, and um, whatever you end up doing, I support you. Be the best uh, uh, hamburger flipper you can be, you know, be the best close salesman that you can, you know, and I will support you. And, and then one day he comes up to me, he goes, how about we go pro? 
And I was like, oh, man, you know, I love boxing, but it wasn't my full on dedication to it. And, and I was like, all right, let's do it. We did a couple of amateur fights. It took me two years to go pro because my dad's very you know, strict about you show me that you want it. Show me that you want it for two years. I fought undefeated and uh, I, there was one there was one loss and I really bummed me out. And then he's like, no, we got to get the rematch. If we beat him on the rematch, we'll go pro. And I and I beat the kid and um, and on the rematch. And then we went pro soon after Bobby hits hits boxing is the local Chicago boxing scene. Um, and we got, you know, contracted with him and uh, I fought for two years. And then on my last fight, 2015, I broke my jaw in the first round. Um, I got up and I won the fight, you know, I came back and came victorious, but a little piece of my career kind of fell off because, you know, the recovery and all that stuff. Then I opened up a gym, which was always the end game plan was to open up a gym. But, uh, um, you know, you get so much responsibilities and two kids later, you know, uh, a gym classes, no, you know, not enough, uh, you know, able to afford another trainer. So, you know, it became my, my everything. And, and in order for me to sacrifice the gym, I would have to break so many hearts. And I was always training out of a garage and I could still do it. It's just like, I guess where my mindset is, is just this excuses of like, I'm, I'm 34 now, you know, what do I really have to prove? Can I really make it up that high when I already have everything that I already tasted, you know, because this wasn't really my, my plan, but it ended up becoming my only route. You know, and when you're faced with that as a young, uh, young adult, if this is your only option, you're never going to quit and you're never going to fail because this is the only thing you got. And I feel like a lot of young fighters, especially with the kids that I teach today, you know, they got jobs, they got girlfriends, they got relationships, and it's hard for them to go pro because they can't sacrifice those things that I was able to do because I had no option. They have options. They got college, they're going to school. They got all these things that fall back out on. And if you look at every successful boxer right now, this is all they had. Canel Alvarez turned pro at 15 years old. He was bullied as a kid. He was made fun of, and he couldn't, you know, come with the terms of something else and you know he became where he's at now you know so and i always tell him like if jake paul can do it why can't you and that usually motivates them to keep going do you sorry. Uh, i got one question sorry if this is like a dumb question and you already answered it or anything like that but like oh good just going back to the 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 charge that you got like yeah. you said kratom wasn't illegal to sell and the poppy seeds wasn't illegal to sell so like what was the like charge against you that they like put on you like was it like intent to like make heroin or what what was it that they actually got you it was uh manufacturing and delivering a control substance which tested out positive for codeine and morphine and that goes back to the point of where you're saying like if there's a if there's a, a speck of cocaine and like three pounds of baking soda they can still get you with that. Is that what that's what you're saying? They will, they will they will charge you for three pounds of it's coke, okay. even though there's just a speck of it. The same so thing with, with poppy pods, you know. And so poppy, poppy pods seeds. have that in them. Yep. And if you eat a bagel of poppy seeds, a hot dog bun of poppy seeds, and you take a drug test the next day, you're gonna fail it. You know, that doesn't mean yeah, that you did it. I mean, you so you, you know what? So it's all fucked up, right? Yeah, it's so that's, fucked up, especially to put like a felony on someone for that. Like, oh, I I missed this part too. The cop he got promoted. He got, he went up a level. I was his last bus to go from his little street drug charges to now he's investigating high, high uh, ballers. You know, because he was able to bust someone like me. And I think <laughs> that's another reason why it was coming after me. Yeah, and did you have a record before that or anything? I mean, I had a, like a, like a, a one gram charge of weed back in, back in high school, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't nothing like I'm, I'm, I'm clean as it gets, you know, except for that right. felony and that, that weed charge. Do you feel, yeah. do you feel like you got robbed of like a lifetime almost? I mean, like, you know, you, like you were saying, it's hard to get into college. Like, you know, you can't, there's certain jobs that are never going to be open to you now. There's certain privileges, like, you know, owning a firearm, for example, that you can never, yeah never do do you ever i guess so i mean um i still got these guns <laughs> i dropped that down no but uh really it was a blessing in disguise i mean 
it's hard to it's hard to really blame others but but i blame myself mostly but then again i also have to be proud of myself because uh you know if it wasn't for the drug charges it wasn't for the felony it, having that experience i would not have this gym right now i wouldn't be teaching kids class today you know my personal client coming in at four like all of those things would have not been available to me this gym would have not existed because when i first started selling kratom and poppy pods at one time um i was I haven't fought in two years since before then, you know, and it was just like something I did in high school. The reason I got into boxing was because I wanted a girlfriend. I wanted a nice body. I wanted to be that cool kid who boxed. And that was my only identity when I started boxing. Cause at three years old, five years old, I hated it. But my dad was a coach and he forced me, he pushed me. He said, you're either going to like it or you're either going to hate it, but you're going to do it. And I did it with hate. And as eventually as I got older, 17, 18, he's like, OK, this is not for him. You know, I'm a man now. Why? Why push him? Right. And um, I've always and then at 16 years old, I was like, I, I love this. I got to do this. I, I'm people will tell me you're so good at boxing. Don't stop. You should really get a couple fights in. And I got I fought. I lost. And that bit the bug in me. Like, I want to feel what it feels like to win. And then I became an amateur from 16 to 20. And then for two years, I was off 22, got busted. Two years later, turned pro at 24. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, at least you have a good outlook on it, man. Yeah. Definitely yeah. a good outlook to have on it. I was, what I'm looking up here is like, so the things, what you were kind of saying earlier was that if one thing has, let's let's just say cocaine in it like let's use that example if the baking powder has cocaine in it and you have three pounds of baking soda powder whatever you're going to get charged with three pounds of it yeah. aren't there some like over-the-counter drugs though like i can't think of the uh my my, my web ugh, my internet's so slow here but doesn't like tylenol or like don't drugs like drugs like that don't they have traces of certain things in them that you can get over the counter well, uh, meth is made from Sudafed, right? You can you can make shake and bake what they call. I, I know all I know is I need Sudafed, and and if you go to certain states in Kansas, you have to it's like a one or two purchase box, but you need like twelve boxes of this shit, and you have to crush up the shit and shake and do whatever the fuck. And um, and you're right, there is some over the counter medicine that has it. You know, but uh, that's the thing, though. It's it's all about intent, you know, and I think that's what happened with me is that I brought it. I delivered it. I spoke about it. And that's what they were trying to charge me with is like, it doesn't matter. You know, like you had the reason to sell it and and you're going to get busted for it, you know. Yeah, but when it comes with intent, your intent. So you had you run the website where you were selling whatever you were selling and yeah. this guy comes and he's like. First of all, the guy, like I wanted to say this earlier, is a fucking scumbag. Like, what is he picking on you for? You know, like, I, you know, he, I don't know what he got charged with, but let's just say that he's a drug dealer, right? He can't go after one of his fucking drug people. He has to go against some random guy on the internet. Like, you know, what a fucking shit bag, you know? But um, anyway, um, it, it seems like a charge where they want to like pick and choose who they go after because like you said it can it can test and it can test positive no matter what so they say with your intent well your intent was you got a message over the the whatever you call it over the internet saying hey can you get me this stuff that stuff was legal that stuff you were able to get legally so why don't they go after the people that you got it from like why are they going after you that that, that doesn't fucking make sense to me it's hard you to know they, fathom that it like went through and like the charges were put yeah out. Yeah, it's, it's insane. It's definitely a loophole they need to close. Um, and, you know, the, the website, whatever, later on, I looked into those websites and they're gone. They, they busted those guys, too. You know, every 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 uh, I can't, poppy pods direct or something, poppy pods, something like that. Poppy pods direct dot com or something got busted. And there was it was I think they were I think it was coming out of Arizona or something like that. And, um, you know, you can grow these plants, you know, you can literally grow them. But it's once you score them and you and you take the razor and you get the ooze dripping out, that's when it becomes illegal. Like the flowers to grow in your garden are beautiful flowers. 
but you know it's just the, again it, you know if you start to mess with it, it that's when you that's when they they say hey you you scored the poppy pod that's illegal that's opium you're busted now you know but you can still grow in your garden they will look past it you know so it, it's just it's just it's weird how it's not like you're some hardened criminal either i mean like i feel like when they're looking at the situation you. you know it's not like it's not like you killed someone or, you know, like you're, you know, just some crazy person like, Hey, you know, you fucked up, you made a mistake. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can blame it on negligence. I don't know, you know, how the courts really look at that. Like, you know, it's kind of like what you said, Oh, you had it. So you're guilty. But I mean, I think there's an intent factor behind it too. Like you're not some, you know, you're not what a Pablo Escobar or something, you know, that was, that was the one risk we didn't want to take though, because even though you feel that way, I feel that way, and every everyone in my life feels that way. The jury, the judge, you know, they want a conviction. The state, the prosecutor, they don't give a shit. They got numbers to hit. They got yeah. a re-election to to win. And it's like to them, it's just like I'm just another pawn in their in their little game. And that's the whole that's the only problem with the justice justice system is that it's tied into the election system, you know. And it, it is what it is. But uh, I gotta I gotta take where I can get. And uh, and and whatever no whatever the cards get dealt I you know I gotta play with it you know I got my jaw broken I'm gonna find a way to win you know right. I got a felony case I'm gonna find a way to win and and luckily and thankfully you know that was the reason why I you know I made it this far even though I didn't go so high far in the pro game you know like I got a I got a documentary coming out you know so I got the the willpower quakes docu series it's good it's gonna be like a like a twelve episode. 30 minute, 40 minute uh, thing. And it's just going to just backtrack of all the things that I went through going through that poppy seed case and dealing with that going pro kind of flashback through my pro game and then take, take those uh, docu-series and try to get it to Netflix or something. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Sully Special. I just wanted to take a few moments to tell you about our sponsor, Ra Wellness. Their goal is to inspire you to take your health into your own hands and fearlessly follow your dreams with the help of their hemp and herbal products. To learn more about Ra Wellness, go check them out at www.feelrocco.com. Again, that's www.feelrocco.com. Raw wellness, sending good vibes one dose at a time. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I just like, yeah, like I said, it's just hard to even fathom because it's not like, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like the guy was like, hey, can you get me these poppy seeds so I can score them and make like, like use them as drugs, correct? No, well, he just wanted that and I just got to that, you know, right. like he asked, like, like, what can I do with them? But I feel like, okay, I because I, I knew that you can do shit with. I knew poppy seeds had heroin and all that, but I, I figured like, well, if it's on the internet and it's getting delivered by the U S postal service, it's gotta be okay to have, right. you know, yeah, that well, was you can, you can, you can buy a car, you can buy a car, a Facebook marketplace, and you can use that car to hurt someone. It, it's not, you know, you know, like you can use anything with ill intent to do something illegal. Like, I don't think that's a, a valid argument. You know, like, I get with what you're saying, but I don't think that's a valid argument for them to be like, well, well you knew what you were getting into. You knew what, you know, yeah. this or that. Yeah, and that was the only argument, really, with 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 what why they did it because I had the intent to bring something that is known to have something. Otherwise, why would you do it in the first place? And when they told me that question, I was like, "He wanted. I'm. I got a a store. I'm. You know, make a sale. Quick, easy buck. Google search, buy and flip. You know, why not? You know, and they weren't having it." Yeah. Well, and then too, I don't like you were talking about like a jury and um, a judge and a prosecutor trying to convict you like, you know, the judge, I guess, I guess, I guess the judge, usually the judge is neutral, you know, like the judge is just there to, you know, keep order in the court, you know, present laws, make sure the court, make sure the court system goes as it should. The prosecutor sounds like a fucking scumbag. Like, I mean, he knows the details, he knows what was done, but it, it, me being someone who I would, I would assume is eligible to be in a jury, I would just have a hard time looking at the facts. And I guess I don't know the facts that they would present. You know, I know everything from what you've said and the things I've seen on the internet, but I would assume it'd be tough for me to be sitting in a jury and for all these things that I know now and to still say that you're guilty of anything. I just, I just don't get that. Like that just sounds so weird to me. And you, you're just yeah. ruining someone's life like that. You're just fucking with someone's life. Like, could you imagine if you go to jail for even a minimum of 12 years, like two weeks, 
yeah, your life, yeah, your life is over after that to a certain degree. I mean, like you're not the same as when you can't went in, you know, when you come out. I'm pretty sure that if I was convicted that uh, I probably either would be dead or I'd be in the, the, you know, cause you gotta pick and choose what race, you know, that's what they say. That's what yeah. I see on TV all the time. I'm like, I, I probably be mixing in with that, with that crowd, you know? Cause I don't want solitary confinement, <laughs> yeah. but then again, like I want protection because, you know, people are crazy in that jail and, and uh, deprived and shit from, from the normal things that we have today what as, did, as free citizens. What did you end up getting charged with? Like what, what did you take in a plea deal? Yeah. I know you said that class I or class one. It was, it was a class one felony up to 200 grams of a controlled substance. Did you, did see you any, have to spend it any time in jail? Or yeah. I was gonna say, did you see any jail time? I just a week in jail, county jail. Um, you know, they 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 interview you. They tell you like how angry do you get? Are you proud of any games, any tattoos? And you 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 get surveyed and you answer all these questions. And then they they put you in the place that they think that would be best suited for you. Uh, and they put me in a in a pretty easy pod. It was just the more of the quiet like you know, people trying to see what's going on with you so they can rat on you too. So, you know, cause that's yeah. what they do. The jailhouse bird will like just rat you out too. So they can have less, you know, and people ask me questions and I would tell them straight up, well, this is bullshit. And I told them what's up. And like, that's bullshit. You know, they, they confirmed with me and they had nothing to put on me because like, Hey, you know, I got a really bullshit case here. And, um, they just, you know, and if one is a one of a kind thing like this, they want to make an example out of you, you know, and I'm, I'm that one big example in Illinois right now. Right. So, well, that's, um, what I was going to say, like, I feel like they'd never completely left you off, would leave you off the hook just because they are trying to use you as an example for whatever point they're trying to prove or whatever power they're trying to show they have. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's fucking crazy. That's insane. Yes. Just the whole situation. What was yeah. uh, I heard that I read that you got four years of parole, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was two years of probation, but the whole thing, my bad, my bad. the whole thing took four years. So wow. um, two years of being convicted or a judge and jury or whatever. And, and even then I could not make any mistakes. And then once the case was over another two years on top of that, to be on good terms, had a probation officer. I would have daily check-ins from officers coming in, knocking on my door saying, what am I up to? And they, they were all cool though. Those guys, those guys were awesome. They really wanted to root it for me and check up on me, make sure I was doing good. And they were excited to hear. I was like, Hey, I'm excited to see you, man. What's going on? What tell me new what's going on. And, it was cool. You know, not, not everyone's bad, but right, there are right. those certain people who are power hungry, who want something more for them. You know, who knows what it is they're dealing with in a day to day. Maybe they don't feel less important. There's only way they feel important is by doing this and they screw people over for their own agenda. And it's unfortunate. Dude, for me, like I hold, I, you know, I, I tend to hold grudges, you know, like Wes and I were talking the other day about a, a grudge I have with someone and Wes was trying to tell me to get off it. But um when those cops were coming to your house like just telling you like you know hey man you know are you you know did you do anything crazy today what are your plans like that like for me it'd be it'd be so hard to like just tell them like not to fuck off or just to be like as, you know like i don't know like they're like yeah you know like what are you doing today i'm like i'm just chilling out you know i just you know i wouldn't tell them shit like obviously it's different in the situation like when you're there but i just feel like it'd be so hard to even talk to these people like i would just think that they're here to get me in trouble not here to help me you would think that, but, um, you know, if you know the kind of person you are, then you're not going to, I feel like, you know, like if I was a game banger and shit, I would probably hate these people, you know, but like when you're, when you look at, uh, the officer who, who, who fucked me over this, like he was a dick. And I'm sure that when he's in that line of work, he deals with so many dumbass people, you know, and you druggies and, and you know, uh, game bangers and all these people who are, are uh, fucked up. Right. And so he becomes almost fucked up as them because there is that like that anti-hero that comes out of him. And, you know, he is what he is. But then you got the 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 probation officers, which is they deal with people that they're assigned to, you know, yeah, that and makes sense. That makes sense. Maybe, maybe they don't get the same brief uh, things back onto them, you know, because there's also the, 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 the cops that pull you over. Those are different type of cops than the drug unit, you know, and I'm sure that like every single bracket or every single um, part of the, the, the police 
have have different they deal with differently things day to day you know and and i'm sure when he looked at me he he saw a colored guy who 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 looks good or i don't know i'm just making judgment but you know i i wouldn't be surprised that he just had a prejudice against me or something like that you know too though you have to think that i mean this guy's a detective drug unit whatever he is in chicago I mean, like Chicago is one of the most dangerous places on earth, you know, like you, you think that this fucking guy would know the difference between a hardened criminal and a fucking scumbag and you, you know, like you'd think that he'd be able to make the connection. Like, yeah, like I get that you're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, like, you know, that things might've changed him, but if it changed him, fuck him, like get him out of there. Like he's, you know, how many other people is he gonna try to fuck over in his, I don't know, 20 year, 10 year, whatever he is. I, re- I, I refuse to remember his name. It was just my grudge against him. But I really wonder what happened with him. And I think the docu people, the docu series people are going to try to get a hold of him or something. But, but uh, he won't say re- shit. He won't say shit. But, uh, he won't say shit. Probably just be a no comment person on this. Yeah. But they're going to try to get like another detective or someone in a similar field and interview him like what would you do and stuff like that they interviewed my lawyer and and she was she was like they said do you think what will did was was um you know was he is, is knowing him and whatever they, they asked her like what what her thoughts were did i knew what i was doing illegal and she she just didn't give it she's like well i think he did both <laughs> You know, I think he, I think he knew that this was wrong, but he also knew that this was OK. And you're going to have to draw a line where where you fall on that spectrum. And, you know, you know, I'm not you know, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. You know, I just I blame ignorance and stupidity. Right. But I just thought it was just an easy sale to get just yeah. like this cop thought it was an easy conv- conviction to get, yeah. you know. So what's been the journey of opening up your gym and everything like that? Like what's been some ups and downs with that? Man, it's been uh, well recently because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, the first couple of years were really tough. My dad was running it more, you know, he was doing everything. And like, I was arguing, we were like bumping heads a lot. And then he gave up on running the gym and it handed it down to me and I'm, and I'm able to sustain it a lot better, you know, cause the social media, the Facebook, the Instagram, the, I got the podcast, like all that stuff he can't do and doesn't know how to do, right. you know, um, every, every week I'm trying to install something new for him, you know, on his phone or whatever. Um, and so um, once he handed it over to me, the gym is doing a lot better. It was still tough when I first got it. Um, you know, the gym was supposed to be my return, come back and whatever. But once business hits, once you have bills to pay and insurance and all this stuff, you're like, oh shit, how am I going to make this money? So doing all the promotion, you know, making the website look good and doing all those things, um, was real tough. And then once you get the whole, once you get the grip of things, then you start flowing out ideas and, and next thing you know that you got this ball rolling and next thing you know, word of mouth can be the greatest thing about your entire business, you know, right. building the community, building the events. We like to host fights here, like, uh, like, you know, pay-per-view fights, UFC or boxing, whatever it is. We got a projector and the projector screen is pretty big and we have parties. Everyone puts in money just to see the fight. And then we pay for food and all that stuff. And is that that community building that really helps uh, get people involved and you make relationships, people stay loyal to you. Um, and that's been great. And then um, the social media part of it, like I make a lot of videos. So I love it. It's fun to record someone and I don't, I'm not recording myself no more. Like I wish I had someone who had the same eye on video camera when they're recording me. Cause there's some videos of me is like, I feel like, I feel like this little like finger and you got this big white screen of open space and it's like zoom in, you know, look yeah. so much better than zoomed in on someone, you know? And so I'm doing that for a lot of the fighters here, trying to build them up and be everything that I needed in my pro game. So that way when they go pro, they have it and, you know, they'll be more successful than me, you know, right. that's, cool, so that's, that's the plan. You know, do you have any hot prospects in your gym right now? Any guys that, you know, you think tear up the world pretty soon here? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't invest, I invest in them, but I don't invest in them too much because I've been disappointed too many times. So I got this one kid, Ryan, he's 17. He's young enough where he can really carry this on fully. 
because once you're dealing with you know the old, the older crowds like the 20s the 23s they already have stuff stabled for them you know unless they get trouble like me and they have nothing left to go you know they only have his boxing right. so yeah. this 17 is being he's being helped by his parents so he's got all the the leverage for him to keep going so when college comes around he is college becomes boxing you know and he can go pro as soon as he turns 18 sure. you know so i'm hoping the best for him he's got he's got four fights he's right now he's on a record of three and one three wins with me and one loss with someone else um and not saying that I'm, i've done anything i i just trying to keep him the way he is and build up build him up what's what his strengths are and his weaknesses kind of help him out but mainly focus on the strengths because you know, no one wants to feel like they're doing th something wrong, you know, and you're constantly fixing the weaknesses. It gets to your head, you know, so I try to try to motivate the strengths and kind of mind, mind, minorly adjust some of the weaknesses in there, which is just the basics. Keep your hands up. Don't be so flashy all the time, you know, because those 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 are the, the weaknesses I see in him. He tries to be flashy and he gets caught, you know, and just like keep your hands up, be disciplined, move. Move the head. You know, a mistake. Of, there's a mistake of youth, though, kind of, isn't it? Like trying to be all flashy and all that kind of stuff. I feel like as you get older, you mature more and all that kind of a drive to kind of be like, you know, TikTok famous or whatever goes away, you know? Yeah. You, you see, he drops his hands. He, you know, he just look cool and stuff and boom, he gets caught, you know? Um, but yeah, he, so far, so far, he can do really good for himself. I try to promote with him as much as I can on my Instagram. Um, and um, hopefully he can continue on, you know, because sometimes there's been a couple other guys. I won't name drop them, but I want to go pro. I want to do this. And then they go, oh, I just enrolled into soccer. I'm like, what the fuck? Why are you doing soccer for? <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're going to do soccer, then go full out. You, know, yeah. you can't be a master or you can't be a jack of all trades and the master of none. You got to pick one. You know, and even with MMA, like they're so good at doing everything, but there's always that one thing they're very good at, you know, and that's the one thing they want to stay at, you know, um, because uh, McGregor, like he's not a good grappler, but he's really good standing up and that's his right. game. That's what he wants to want to fight you in, you know, and, 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 and was it Oliver? Oh, Charles you know, like, Oliver. Charles Oliver. Yeah. Yeah. He's so great at, on the ground, you know, yeah. and, and uh, his stand up's pretty good too. But like, that's what I feel. It's like you have to just just that prioritize that one thing that you want the most, you know, yeah, and then sure. guess what? He hurts he his toe. You know, he, he, he bummed out his toes all swollen and stuff. I'm like, Psh. you know, and that you got you got an exhibition fight coming up and, and you playing soccer. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, I know. I know Weston doesn't like soccer too much, so I'm sure he's got to take a break here. Just to <laughs> tear it off here. No, dude, I got a, I got a bladder like an old man, dude. I got to run to the bathroom real quick, but I'll be back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. No, it's because he's taking a second because he heard the word soccer. He hates oh, soccer. Yeah. Um, no, one thing I want to ask you. Um, so I'm doing Golden Gloves. I know, like I've I've reached out to you for a couple questions here and there about that. I know, I know, like at the amateur level, it's kind of just like swing and bang. You know, really, it's not really much like technique and stuff. Um, but when it comes to training boxing. Um, I think that there, the gym I go to now, I won't name drop them because I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but this is at least from my understanding. Okay. Um, the gym I go to now is very big on just sparring, like, you know, just figuring it out yourself. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna hit a punching bag. We're not gonna, you know, walk backwards a hundred steps. We're not going to walk for, you know, forward a hundred steps to the side to side, a hundred steps. And when I first started going to that gym, I'm like, oh, this is weird. You know, like it's not, it's not normal fighting, you know, like I'm not going up, you know, under a rope and stuff like that. I'm not doing the steps. And then I went to a, to a boxing gym, you know, and uh, that boxing gym, all I was doing was going forward in a line, backward in a line, side in a line, you know, like just, you know, throwing a jab and like, you know, nothing after that. And I noticed going to the gym that I'm at now, I noticed that my skills got a lot better because like I wasn't maybe practicing the fundamentals of boxing, but I was practicing boxing. What, what do you think about like the old school boxing training and the evolution of it now? Do you still do a lot of like, you know, busy work or you know what I mean? Well, the old school boxing is it definitely 
will will separate the weak from the strong and then the ones who are strong are the coaches of the ones they're going to focus the most attention on and that's what i've noticed a lot back when i was fighting too like a lot of the gyms that i was you know going out to spar or train you know that's how they would you know figure out like okay is it worth my time to invest on this kid who who quits after the first round of sparring or whatever the case may be and you're definitely going to learn that but you're going to learn the hard way and who knows how long it's going to take you to to learn learn in that way you know it's like pretty much they're teaching you how to get your ass beat and not quit and and sometimes that could help because you will come back and fight and get raw and put on this rage and and win the fight in that way because the guy gets tired out like rope a dope. Um, but that's not the safest way. Is no is the smartest way of training, but it is a way of training. When I say old school boxing, though, what I mean by that is like the drills and technique. You know, like you know, push off your front foot and then go backwards with your back foot. Like I feel like a lot of like old school boxing training isn't really relevant to today just because we have so much more science. We have so much more data to be able to say like, Hey, this is a better way to train than what they were doing 30, 40 years ago. Are you still like as a gym owner, as a coach yourself, are you still doing drills that, you know, just but, like, do you find benefit in those? Like, what, like, because at least when I spar, I never noticed myself using the, you know, correct footwork fundamentals when it comes to walking forward and walking sideways. Like, you know, after the third, fourth round, it kind of just turns into a, a who wants it more kind of thing. Well, I, I, I feel like the old school way of training is just sparring all the time. That's what my version of it, because uh, a lot of the new school stuff, the boring stuff, the basics is, is what really is boxing. It's just combined with everything else. So, you know, keeping your hands up, you got to keep them up no matter how good you get, you know, spinning off your, your front foot, you know, pivoting off your back foot turning the hips these are all basics that are just in a combination of everything else that makes it more advanced so doing the same thing over and over again is going to help you develop the same hip turn over and over again which is going to develop the same sidestep along with the jab along with the pivot and all of it's just going to be one big basic move just combined all at the same time if that makes sense we'll sort and, uh, of rebuke that a little bit though if i'm if i'm just let's say i'm practicing my jab right if i'm just yeah. in the punching bag with my jab and i do it 500 times a day 600 times a day 700 times a day and then when i go in and spar someone i can't land my jab because well the punching bag isn't moving the punching bag isn't throwing back the punching bag isn't doing anything but just basically being a wall right there that's like, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, that's why I think that that sparring, I guess maybe I was describing it wrong earlier when I said old school, but maybe that like just consistent sparring, I think is far more helpful, like not going a hundred miles an hour, you know, pulling punches and stuff like that. But at least for me, I've noticed that it's just a lot more helpful in the sense of I'm getting real looks and I'm, you know, maybe I don't have the best technique, but at least I know how to land something, you know, very, very interesting outlook, very interesting outlook because I, because I, what I've been used to, what I've seen a lot is that you know, oh, you want to fight? Okay, go in there. And they go in there and they're like, maybe I don't want to fight because I got my ass beat. Right. You know, and that becomes the old school version that I've grown up with. And the science of like doing all these basic moves and then pushing you into sparring and then taking you back and then kind of reteach you those things again. Yeah. Jab only this round. No, no crosses, no hooks. Jab only. Get good at mastering landing that jab because that's the best way to really learn is getting hit back and making getting that feedback of like, oh, I threw my jab, but it went down. I got caught, you know, so that will teach you. And and, uh, and this is the hard way to learn too. I always tell people there's three ways to learn boxing. You can watch it, study it, you know, boxing fights, whatever, videotapes, your sparring sessions. You can also just practice it, do it, train it, you know, drill it. And then you could listen like, like this would be advice, you know, for example, you're listening to boxing and this is why you keep up your hands up. This is why you jab all the philosophies. So you could watch it, do it and listen to it. And those are the three ways that are going to get you to where you got to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and the other thing is the, the three training styles is you can do it by yourself, which is great, but you have no feedback and you have no coach eyeing you. Hey, don't forget your feet are twisted up. Hey, you're dropping that right hand. We throw that hook. And, and when we're doing it ourselves, we don't really think about everything else. We don't, we only focus on the one thing we're doing. 
and uh, we got personal training, which is also great. But the problem is, it's going to cost you more money. But you're getting all of coach's time, which is very helpful and very uh, worth it, you know. And you're getting a full hour or half hour, whatever it is. All the attention is on you. And then the third way is classes. The downside of that is that your time is divided with everyone else with coach. And that's the hard part with classes. But if you balance those three things out, Monday is solo training, Tuesday is private training, the Wednesday is class training, and you just mix it up, it's just, it's going to be helpful, you know? So it's hard to teach 10 people how to throw a right jab, uh, the correct jab, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, but it's a lot easier once you start to really get in there and, and learn how to do it. But then you go home and practice what you saw in sparring. Right. What would I, I feel like Lucas, you're like the young buck that just wants to make it on the highlight reel and doesn't want to practice it. No, 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 it's not that. It's kind of it's kind of what so like Wesson is a wrestler at Chattanooga, University of Chattanooga D1. Um I guess it's a question for Weston now more. When you wrestle, do you find it more beneficial to yourself to just drill? And, and it's an honest question. I'm not trying to yeah, sex. Yeah, no, you're good. But do you find yourself, do you find it more beneficial for yourself to just, let, let's say you're doing a high crotch, just drill the high crotch 5,000 times over. But then once you get into a match, you're like, okay, well, yeah, I drilled the high crotch so many times over, but you know, now the guy's sprawling. Now the guy's moving. Now the guy's not giving me the setups I want to get. Like, right. I'm saying like, don't you think it'd be more beneficial to get in there and actually do it live? And you don't have to do it at hundred percent, 30, 40, 50%, but at least get a real look rather than just going back to the boxing example of just hitting a punching bag where the punching bag isn't hitting back or moving. Anything. Sure. But here's my thought process on it. Like, okay. So one, I'm, I'm a division one, like I'm at the division one level. So more than likely, I've already hit the high crotch or like the jab per se so many times in practice, correct? Like how proficient are you at boxing? I mean, not as proficient as you are as wrestling. Correct. So maybe it's in your best interest to better your jab or better your high crotch in my, like, like if I was not as proficient as I am in wrestling, right? Now my skill level, maybe it's best for me to like see different looks and stuff like that and get that more real feel because I've hit my high crotch so many times, right? But one thing my coach always says is like, we like when you get tired, you turn back to the basics. And if you don't have core fundamental basics, when you get tired, that's when you lose. Mm -hmm. So like when I get tired in a wrestling match or in a boxing match, if you're not good at those basics, if they're not like semi like unconscious, you can't, you can do them just without thinking. If you can't do that, then when you get tired, you won't be able to do them. So you need to be, get so good at them where you don't need to think about them. And then that's what wins matches because when you get tired, you stay in good position and you stay in your stance or you stay in your boxing stance, stuff like that. You keep your hands up and you don't get hit in the face when you're tired because you don't even need to think about these things. And that's why you have to practice them over and over and over and over. No, and, and, that's, and that definitely makes sense. And there's definitely, you know, I know we're kind of jumping back from boxing to wrestling here, but going from a boxing sense, I know there's benefits of, you know, hitting the punching bag of, you know, doing something like that. I'm, I'm just like, at least from what's worked better for me, and maybe it's just my personal opinion, but when I practice on the bag, you know, the, the teardrop bag, the, the long bag, the heavy bag, whatever, I just noticed that it doesn't translate over for me as well as when it comes to actual sparring, then I would, that it, then it would, if I was just sparring all the time, because I feel like, at least for me, when I'm actually doing it, when I'm actually learning it, that's when I'm picking up the mental notes to be like, oh, okay, this is what works for me. This is how I land this. Like, you know, I got to think my way through it rather than just like, well, yeah, this is the fundamentals to do it. I got to, you know, you know, step forward, plant my foot and, you know, twist at the last second. Like, I don't know. This is something that worked for me. I was just curious, I guess, more to will, like, am I right on that? Or what do you think about that? You know? No, I, no, I, I agree with both of you, you know, but you do need sparring, you know, that's not, you can't forsake that because um, you need to, you need to get that feedback that you are doing it right or wrong. If you land the jab, then obviously you're doing it right. And if you did it wrong, you're obviously getting hit. Um, and the thing with the heavy bag, it doesn't hit you back, but you know, your sparring partner may not be there all the time, you know, and you may me go against some, some low level guys and you're like, you know, you can do it. You know, you need those high level guys to see if you can really do it. And those high level guys may or may not be there or they may look down on you like you're the low level guy. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you got to get the practice in somewhere, somehow. It's just a matter of just like identifying, okay, you're visualizing and, and, and doing it the safest way. So when you go up there, you already have like a mental, like visual, 
you know, visual visionary kind of way of, you know, practicing it and you just apply it into sparring, um, you know, because a lot of the boxing that I've learned is just watching a lot of tapes. Oh, the way he slipped the jab and then he threw a jab right underneath it. And then I go into the heavy back and I slip the jab, throw out the jab right underneath it and visualizing it. And then when it's sparring, I try to go against a low level guy. Boom, I could do it with him. All right, cool. And then, hey, you know, let me let me practice with you. Let's do a couple of rounds. And I just try for, for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, get as much experience as I can trying to do the same move over and over again. And then, like, maybe the last round, all right, let's do the full sparring. Everything goes, you know, and then just trying to do it over and, and try to do everything you can, you know, because you only have a split moment to realize you did it right or wrong, you know. Right. And, and, and if you did it wrong a thousand times, the one time you do it right – it's going to click so easy for you that you're going to be able to repeat it again. You just got to do it right one time. And then once you get it right, you just like, okay, I know how to recognize this situation, you know, but then next thing you know, that situation is gone. It happened such in the flash that you better have a plan B because one saying they say in boxing is don't admire your work. You know, you, you did it right. Boom. You feel good about it. Oh shit. Boom. Boom. They hit you two more times. So you got to have a plan B after you land the shot or you follow up with three or four more punches because that moment will end. And then there's going to be a new moment where they may be able to capitalize after you did your moment, you know, and the judges always remember the last 30 seconds of the fight, you know, right. That recency bias, like bias doesn't matter what happened 10 seconds ago. It matters what's happening now. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I feel like so, you're just almost trying to jump steps where it's like, you need to learn you got to get the fundamentals so you can apply them in sparring, you know, like, if you never know how to throw a jab, how are you going to throw a jab as far? There's definitely a discipline thing behind it too, you know, because like the jab can, you know, when I broke my jaw, the jab was the one thing that saved me, you know, and being disciplined on just throwing it, getting out of the way, making sure this guy doesn't get close to me because your jab is still one long punch. Because if you put out your cross, it's back here, right? And it takes you more time to land it. Versus the jab is more in front and you got those extra inches to actually land it a lot faster and a lot closer than your cross is just way behind you, you know, and um, it's just those, those little things that that you start to realize with experience that the jab is the fastest, easiest punch to land first and then everything else can follow up after that. You know, and you no, know, it's it's hard. No one wants to do the same thing over and over without feeling mundane and redundant. Um, and it's just a matter of just in sparring, do one round only jabs. Don't let even don't even tell them you're gonna do that. So that way you can get the experience of landing it and doing it wrong and doing it right a bunch of times. Yeah. And then maybe the second round, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try my double jab cross hook and just do that three or four times. And then give them a new combo, jab, cross, hook, cross, and be disciplined on it. Don't think about anything else. Uh, I see a body shot. You're not focusing on the body shot right now. And then like if, if, and you can change it third round, all body shots, get really good at moving your head, ducking, rolling, try to land that body, you know? And then when it comes to your fight, you'll be so well-rounded. It's kind of like MMA, you know, you got your ground game, you got your stand up game, you know, and it's just, you got to have your, your jab game, you know, your inside game, your outside game, your footwork. You know? yeah. So that's one uh way to look at it. No, no, I appreciate that answer. That definitely makes sense. I guess, you know, I, and kind of what Weston's saying is, you know, like I am, I think too impatient. Like, I think I just want like the end result without sometimes having to go through like the process. Like I just love sparring. Like, it's just fun for me. Like either, even if I'm like losing, it's just fun. Cause it's just such like a live look. And I just really enjoy that. Like, I don't know, like that it's just for me, it's like, I have a short attention span when it comes to like, you know, just standing there by myself on the bag and just jabbing it for five hours. Like it's, I, I, learn, I know it you helps, but you will definitely learn the basics really fast. Cause you got that mentality. You, you jab. Okay. Boom. Done. What's next and cross boom. Okay. You know, yeah. that functionality that you got to uh, discipline yourself with. So that way you're disciplined in the fight too. Um, What's the, what's the name of your gym again? I, I apologize. I know you told me earlier earlier. Uh, power boxing and fitness. Power boxing and fitness. Do you guys have any uh, heavyweights down there? Uh, yeah, yeah. We got a brand new. Uh, he's twenty years old. Uh, two twenty. Um, uh, he's tall, dude. He's like six five. Okay. And uh, what are, what are the odds you let me go down there for a, for a sparring night before my Golden Gloves fight? 
Sure. Where are you from? Anyway? Wisconsin, right? Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah. Milwaukee. It's not too. That's how about two hours? Give or say, I'd I'd make the drive. I I just want to get some good sparring sessions in before my fight. Yeah, and if we don't have the guy for you, I can always call someone else. You know. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll, yeah, text, I'll text you about it. What's your weight? Uh, I'm like 230, 235, right around there. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, and how tall? 6'2". I mean, I say 6'2". Oh, three. perfect. Six, All right. So it will work. He's like 4'6", 6'3". I can't even tell you, you know, because I just remember he's just being tall. Uh, so yeah. was, you know, and even though um, I went in there with him, too, so I can go in there with you, too. You know, I'll help you out. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, my conditioning is not the same anymore, but <laughs> my, my pace has changed a lot. So my pace is more of like, let me just have him throw punches at me. Let me practice my defense. <laughs> and then if you see opening, I'll take it, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yes. was, um, was, so I, I was looking up your record. I don't know if it's correct here. It said you were 6-0-1. and one. Yeah. Was the, was the one, was that the one you broke your jaw in? That's the one draw. That's a draw I got. I won my broken jaw. Oh, okay. I was gonna say I didn't know if it like it went to like a medical like draw or something like that because you broke your jaw. Like, I don't know if it was early on. There was enough rounds to do. My draw was the second fight. I my my win with the broken jaw was a uh, six round fight. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. That's pretty badass, man. I'm going in the broken jaw and just winning. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't even tell my dad. Like my jaw was like it was broken and dropped the mouthpiece. The ref picked it up, put it back in my mouth. And I'm like, oh, shit. I was pushing on my tongue, trying to keep the mouthpiece in. Yeah. And every punch, even if I blocked it, I, it would just have so much pain. And oh, yeah. that really helped me. He's like, you know, I don't want to get hit again. He <laughs> jab, jab. And those those are the things that's going to really make you learn. It's like, you know, that pain is what really will motivate you to go through with anything. You know, it's like. <laughs> Yeah. So, and didn't get caught again. He didn't hit me once again. And I won the fight because of that one terrible situation. And don't get into that situation. Make it feel like you broke your jaw. So that way you train that way, you know? Right. right. Yeah. Hey, man. Um, I, again, I just really want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, I'm not trying to kick you off here. I just try to keep these to about like an hour, give or take. Oh, I get it. I, I got the same. same. Dude, I feel like I feel like I could talk to you for like hours. So it's like I don't want to I don't, I don't want to piss off the audience. But like, oh, my gosh, you're doing four hour episodes here. So one, one yeah. last question, though. Who's your favorite boxer? Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. Um, you know, when I was watching in the amateurs, I will always watch the pound for pound champion because there's a reason why he's pound for pound. So if you ask me today, it'd be Canelo because he's ranked number one. I don't know too sure no more because he lost. But back then it was Floyd Mayweather. And I would just watch him every single year because he was always pound for pound. Sure. And then I will watch Manny Pacquiao. Then I watch. But my childhood hero was Julio Cesar Chavez. And it was always the body shot that did it. And that was one of my signature moves. I would just hit you in the body and you will drop. Um, but like, it's really hard to pick because I also love Sugar Ray Robinson, an old yeah. school classic, you know? Sure. So it's a, it's a very hard question for me to answer, but I, I thought you were like, going to say oh. Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a whole other tangent we get into too, but maybe, maybe a part two of your audience likes it. Sure, sure. <laughs> Hell yeah.